Good morning, church. It is a blessing to be able to come and worship with all of you folks. It's a blessing that it's a little cooler. It's been fairly humid and sticky for the last few weeks, and it's nice to have a little reprieve from that for a few days, I hear. Today is a high Sabbath, as we've heard several times, we're going to have a few baptisms today. So for my topic this morning, I want to talk about commitment. I want to talk about our commitment with Jesus, as we're going to be witnessing a very beautiful um, ceremony and celebration, really of an outward sign of what's already taken place on the inside of these individuals, of what Jesus is already doing in their life, and it's, it's going to be exciting to see. <clears throat> I heard a story a few weeks ago at Big Camp, just a brief story, one of the preachers presented there, and there was a a pig and a chicken that were walking down the street, and they saw a sign that said, uh, uh, hungry, need of food, and they had this great idea, and they said, "Uh, I have a great idea, the chicken said to the pig, let's feed the hungry, and they said, oh yeah, let's do that, that's a great idea, and the chicken says, I know. Let's feed them bacon and eggs. And the pig's like, yeah, that... Wait a second. See, for you, that's only a partial commitment in feeding the hungry. But for me, I'm all in. That's an entire commitment. So that's what we're talking about today is an entire commitment to Jesus. So if you just bow your heads with me one more time, we're going we're gonna to pray Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege to come and to worship you. Lord, we want to present our lives to you as a living sacrifice today. We want to be entirely and fully committed to you. We want nothing between us and our Savior. So the Lord, just guide our thoughts. Lord, as we study from your word, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12. We see a very familiar passage there that I'm sure most of you could probably quote it off by memory better than I. But in Romans chapter 12 and in verse 1, Paul is pleading, he's begging, and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. He's getting quite personal here. He's begging, just calling, coming aside, he's saying he's calling these people in Rome his brothers. He says, I beg you, my brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly accepted to God, which is your reasonable service. It's your reasonable service to present your body as a living sacrifice. Throughout the Old Testament, if you wanted to present a sacrifice to the God of heaven, you would bring a lamb that would die. And, and God takes us a step further in the New Testament that that sacrificial system is done away with. It was nailed to the cross If you want to present a sacrifice to God, it's that you don't die once for the God of heaven, but you live. You choose to dedicate your whole life. He says, present your bodies, every part of your being, not your foot, not your hand, not your head, but your whole body presented to him as a sacrifice. Not to die once, but to live, to live for him. Now, there's two thoughts that we can follow in this which were one and the same, that we can present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God by, by living healthfully, amen? <laughs> that we could drink good lots of water, that we can eat healthy food, that we can eat our multivitamins and exercise daily. Yes, we can present our bodies and live healthfully for Jesus, amen? But it plays on the fact that if we have healthy bodies, it helps us to have healthy minds, And Paul gets into that in the next verse in Romans 12 and verse 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to surrender our minds to a heavenly teacher. And often this requires an unlearning what the world has taught us to be true and upright. See, in this world, selfishness is what makes you successful. Selfishness is what makes you succeed. If you want to get ahead in life, that you put others down, you push others aside so that you can succeed and become great. You know, I read an article, well, the first line on the Northern Advocate online this week. 
It said $4,500 cash in a lost wallet goes back to the honest Wangare finder. The first line in the article says, Honesty pays for a Wangare man who has handed in a wallet crammed with cash. This guy found a wallet, $4,500, and he turned it in. And nobody has come forward to claim it, so that goes back to him. And they're saying honesty pays. Now, what I find interesting and funny in these situations is that this gets like headline news. That honesty pays. Because honesty, it is such a rarity it seems in this life that we have to, it's like a strange thing that we put it on the front of the newspaper. Honesty pays. We need a mind change. Amen? We need to surrender our minds to the master teacher and to unlearn what the world has taught us to be true. A few years ago, I used to drive a logging truck, and I remember I was out in the middle of nowhere, and I stopped over to pull, pull over to check my load to make sure it was all secure and ready as I was coasting into town to go to the mill. And I stopped, checked the load over, jumped back in the truck, and I was just pulling away when I saw something out of the corner of my eye on the ground. Now, I'm 100 kilometers either direction from any civilization, and I see something strange in the corner, on, at the corner of my eye, and I'm thinking, oh, it's just a piece of rubbish. And I thought, now I better stop. It's going to bother me all the way to town. So I jump out, and sure enough, there was a wallet lying on the ground. And I pick it up, and there was $720 cash in it. And I look a little closer. Now, remind you, this is in Canada, okay? And I see a bank card poking out of it that says A and Z. Now, we don't have A and Z in Canada. I'm thinking, wait a second, I got one of those cards too. I go a little further, and here's a Kiwi driver's license. What are the odds, right? I call up my Kiwi auntie, Auntie Paula, and she knows a friend who knows a friend, and we start calling people back in New Zealand might know this guy. You get, a hard, close, get in touch with the, the policeman. It also had a, a fishery license in it for the South Island for fresh, freshwater fisheries. And we're searching, and we finally get to the head of the department of the fisheries, and we're like, we have this guy's wallet. We just need his fun, phone number so we can call him. And he said, sorry, we can't give you that information for privacy purposes. He said, we have his wallet here. We want to give it back to him. Anyways, we couldn't get through, so we turned it into the local police in Canada. And a few weeks later, an article comes out. And this man sit, writes into the local newspaper. And the newspaper says, the man only wished now to say thank you to the person who did the right thing. And this is what the man said. His name was Graham Page. He lives in the South Island. I have no way of knowing who it was, but I just want to say thanks. It really restores my faith in people. That's what he said. Now later, actually, him and I got in contact, and we exchanged a few emails, and uh, he said thank you properly. But I wasn't doing it to say thank you. I was doing it to be honest. Why is it that we have to restore our faith in humanity? See, we've lost faith in humanity because most people will just pick it up and run. And they think, his loss, my gain. Friends, we need a mind change. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. We see an interesting passage here. What God is calling us to. Ephesians 4 and it says there in verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, or you might say as the rest of the world, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. And in verse 19, it says, Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to working all uncleanliness with greediness. In other words, living impure lives. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have, given, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitfulness of lust, and be renewed in the spirit of of your mind. God is calling us, friends, to put off, to cut off, to, to unlearn our former life of selfishness and to learn His way of love, of joy, of peace, 
of patience, of kindness, of gentleness, and self-control. To be renewed in the spirit of our mind. It comes from being in contact with Jesus. You know, it comes from spending time with Him in His Word. It comes from spending time in nature. It comes from spending time in fellowship with other believers and singing His praises. It, spends, it comes, this new mindset, by spending time with Jesus. And we need this mind change. We need this mind change because, friends, our bodies, our life is in a continual attack from the devil. You see, the devil is an outright war against the God of heaven, and he's outright trying to get as many of God's purchased possessions as possible. That's you, purchased with the blood of Jesus. And he's trying to rob God of his purchased possessions and to bring as much pain to God as possible. So, friends, we need to guard our living sacrifice. We need to guard our minds. When doubts arise, we need to hold on to God and faith in His Word. When, when disappointments come, when discouragement meets you, when depression engulfs you, we need to hold on to God and faith. Or when even fortune welcomes you, or the warm winds of ease blow over you, we still need to hold on to God and faith. You see, God, the devil is real tricky. He'll use whatever he can to try and to distract us to try and dissuade us from our attraction to God. There's a story of a parable uh, of, a, of a man that was a sower in, in Matthew chapter 13. Turn with me there. Matthew chapter 13. You know the story. There's a sower that went forth to sow. And he spread the seed everywhere, it fell on the wayside, and birds came and ate that seed. Some, feed, some seed, it fell in and, and stony places. And when the, it, the seed it sprang up, the hot sun came, and the, and the seed, the, the plant, it withered away. Some seed, it fell among thorny grounds. And when the, the plant sprouted up, it was choked out by the other thorns. And finally, some seed, it fell in good ground, and it grew up, and it produced much fruit. You know the story, but Jesus expounds on that story in Matthew chapter 13. And it says in verse 18, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives the seed by the wayside. These individuals, these hearers, those that have fell by the wayside, they've been hardened by sin. Yes, there's a desire, whether they know it or not, there is a desire there to know God. And whenever that desire is first, that first inkling in their heart comes, something better comes along and they just go with the flow. I don't know how many times this happens to me. I make appointments day in and day out to go and I study the Bible with people and they say, yeah, I want to know God, I want to know His Word. And I said, okay, we'll be there at such a time and such a place. And it says, I'll be there. And I show up and they're not there. <laughs> and then the next day I call them up and said, bro, where were you? And they said, oh, the cousins came by, the friends came by. We went to the beach. Something better come along, a better offer. And God's word is no longer as important. Verse 21, 20, it says, And he who received the seed on stony ground... This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. These are those that receive the word of God with gladness. They're happy. They're overjoyed. But then they soon realize that walking with God doesn't mean puppy dogs and roses, that sometimes there's, there's hardship. But that doesn't mean that God isn't with us but God is with you in the fight. It means to hold on in faith, but they say it's too much. The sun is too hot. The persecution is too much. And so they say, enough with this, and they throw their faith out the door. Verse 22, Now he receives a seed among the thorns. He who hears the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Maybe you've met someone like that that has been choked out by the cares of this world. That maybe a better business opportunity has come along and 
and there's just not enough time in life for God anymore, and they have to do this and that and the other thing, and there's no more time for God. And it's such a sad thing that eventually there's just not even an interest anymore, and they throw God out the door. It's sad. I have in times past knocked on a lot of doors, um, inviting people to study God's Word, inviting people to, to consider their the times that we're living in and they say I don't have time for that that sounds great but I don't have time for that and I see through the window their 96 inch big screen TV on and they're watching the latest football game or rugby game I don't have time to get to know God the cares of this life they choke it out finally in verse 23 it says but he who receives the seed on the good is the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. They produce much fruit. These are those that have counted the cost. They understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And they say, yeah, it's worth it. Come what may, even though there's, there's ease, even though there's persecution, I still want my lot to be cast with Jesus. And there's growth in them. But what I find in, in, interesting in all these other cases, the devil is trying to snuff out that desire, to snuff out that living sacrifice that they could give to God, their life, trying to snuff out that desire, be it birds, be it cares, be it thorns, be it stones, whatever, trying to rob God of his purchased possession. We need to guard our hearts and minds because we are under attack, friends. Jesus is coming soon and there's nothing worth keeping us from him in eternity. Nothing. I want to read one last story. It's in the book of Genesis chapter 15. It's an interesting story. There's a guy by the name of Abram there who later became Abraham, which you might be more familiar with. He's first called Abram, and in Genesis chapter 15, just to set up the story, kind of the mindset of what Abraham was happening in chapter 15, is just previously in chapter 14, Abraham has just come back from fighting a battle. See, his nephew Lot had been captured, and we read Abraham about this guy, Abraham in Scripture, as being a righteous man, but righteousness does not mean that Abraham was a wimp by any means. But Abraham, along with his 318 servants, trained in battle, they go up to get their boy Lot. So they go and they, 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 they fight back the, the army that had captured Lot, and they take his, their boy home. They take Lot, their nephew, home. Now, I don't know if this ever happened to you as a child. I see this between my two children. Is my little girl, she might hit my boy. And my boy isn't happy with that, obviously. So what does he do? He hits her back. And this goes on that they keep throwing blows until we have to say, hey, cut that out. But they're trying to, when I'm hit, I want to inflict as much pain or more on the other person. And it's this ping pong back and forth of trying to hurt one another. This is what's happening here with, with Abraham. Is that he's thinking in his mind, yes, we got my boy back. But what's going to happen next I've just sacked this army but what happens of the few that have escaped they're going to go home and tell their buddies and my life of peace li living in this land it's, it's possibly over what's going to happen next what can of worms have I opened up now I want to read the first ver verse of Genesis chapter 15 a lot's going on in Abraham's mind but look what God says to Abraham he says and after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. You are exceedingly great reward. Ha! Huh. What a comfort that would have been. Abraham, he's just... The, the vivid images of battle are in his mind, and he's wondering, man, is this going to come home to my tent? What have I done? And God says, Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield got your back Abram Abram said Lord God what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus and Abram said 
Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Abraham's got a lot going on in his mind. Am I safe? Who's going to take my inheritance? I have no children. God, what are you going to do with this situation? Verse 4, And the, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside, and he said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars. And if you are able to number them, and he said, So shall your descendants be. When Abraham looked up at those stars, those stars, they represented you. Because it's not by direct genealogy lineage that God was speaking about, but those that come to God in faith. We read in the book of Galatians that those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that are those that are the children of Abraham because they exercise faith in God. And he says, look, look at the stars. That's as many children as you're going to have. The Bible says, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And when he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said to the Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all of these to him, and he cut them in two. Now, don't lose me here, okay? He cut these animals in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. This is strange. This is weird. God, Abraham asked God for a sign. How can I know this is all going to happen? How do I know that you're going to protect me? How do I know you're going to give me a lineage? You're going to give me a child? How do I know that I will inherit this land? And God says, bring these animals, these three animals and the two birds. And he does, and he cuts them in half and leaves them aside. In those days, this is how you would seal a pact. This is how you would seal a covenant or a promise. That if you're really serious about your agreement, you would cut an animal in half. I know this is crazy, but you cut it in half and leave the pieces apart, signifying that the life of this animal testifies that each in this agreement, they're going to hold to their word. And then the people in this agreement would then walk between the pieces of this carcass signifying that if either one of them goes back on their word, so should happen to them. In other words, on my life, I will keep to my word. Abraham cuts these animals in half. And it says in verse 11, and when the vultures came down to the carcass, Abram drove them away. We read in Romans chapter 12, it says, present your body as a living sacrifice. I pray that we can be as diligent with our sacrifice to God, that we would drive those birds of distractions, of cares, of woe away. Don't let them plague our mind, but trust God in faith. As Abraham here is driving those birds away from his sacrifice to God. And when the sun was gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And God begins to say, hey, the future is not going to be bright. There is going to be some disappointments, but again, hang on in faith. But he shares some words with him. But at the end of this vision, Abraham comes to, and it says in verse 17, And it came to pass, when the sun went down, and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt, and so forth, and describes all these different lands. I'm going to give it to you, Abram. God seals a deal with Abram. He says, Cut these animals in two. How do I know it to be true? How can I trust you, God? God then passes through the pieces that were cut in two. Now, think with me. Did Abraham go back on God's word? Yes or no? Did he try and fulfill God's promises in his own way and in his own time? Yes or no? Absolutely. Read the next chapter. We see the whole issue with Hagar. 
Should Abraham, this would be crazy, should he have been cut in two? Yes or no? Absolutely. He'd gone back on his word. But friends, this is what commitment is. When making a commitment with Jesus, is that it was Jesus that passed between those pieces. And even though in our shortcomings, Jesus says, I'll die for you, and he did. Jesus died so Abraham didn't have to die for his sins. And it says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And today, friends, there's going to be some individuals that are making a commitment for Jesus. And they're not coming forward saying, from here on out, I'm going to be sinless. No. What they're saying is that they're coming forward and they're saying that Jesus is sacrifices enough for me. And that from today on, I'm going to be clean to his sacrifice to cover my shortcomings, to cover my failures. That I'm trusting Jesus, that he will perform and continue to perform that good work in me to transform me and mold me into his image. Some of you, many of you here have been baptized. As I do when I watch other baptisms, I think of that first commitment when I made to Jesus when I was baptized. I want you to think about that, but I also want you to think that maybe have you have your steps ever ever shook? Have you ever gone back on your word with Jesus and made some mistakes? And today, just in your heart, as you witness this beautiful commitment, that in your own heart and in your own life, make that remake that commitment with Jesus. I don't know if there's someone here today that just simply just wants to raise their hand and say, God, I recognize that even though I was baptized 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or whatever, but still today I freshly recognize that one, I, I want to present my life as a sacrifice, but two, I need Jesus. And I'm thankful that Jesus passed between those pieces and that in every time that I've gone back on my word, Jesus says, my sacrifice was enough for you. And today, you just want to reconfirm that commitment to Jesus. If that's your desire, I invite you to raise your hands with me right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus and, and for the beautiful witness and testimony we're going to see here in just a few moments of people making that full and utter commitment, giving their whole body to you, their whole life. And we're grateful for that. Jesus, I want to pray for those special individuals that you will be with them, that you will bless them. But for those right now that are recognizing again and afresh that they need Jesus and they need his sacrifice to cover their sins in their life today, Lord, pray for a special blessing over them as well. We're thankful that you took our sins to the cross and we, you dealt with it there and that we can have the hope of eternal life in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.